Well, the city of San Jose uh, fairly recently adopted a new policy where they're going to, guess what, charge people for owning guns and then making them take out liability insurance. The actual ordinance is hard to find. It took me a while, but I was able to pull it down. And here it is, and we're going to read it. And while it may be funny to some, this is not funny to anyone who loves freedom and the Second Amendment's right to bear arms. Hello out there. I am trying to get through. With his powerful brain waves cradled in the warmth of reasoning, it's time for Johnny Walker Dread to straighten you out on a thing or two. Emanating all the way from exciting Las Vegas, Oklahoma, it's the Johnny Walker Dread Show. All right, let's take a look at this. This is uh, an ordinance of the city of San Jose, adding part six to chapter 10.32, whatever, whatever, of the San Jose Municipal Code to reduce gun harm by requiring gun owners to obtain and maintain liability insurance and establishment of annual gun harm reduction fee. So this is a two-sided whammy. They're going to get you with insurance and a fee, which is also called a tax. All right, here we go. And this is where the fun begins. Whereas the Constitution of the United States of America affords certain protections to the ownership of firearms. Gee, massive understatement there. The last time I heard, it stated that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's not just certain protections. And then it says, whereas the United States Supreme Court has recognized that the constitutional protections related to firearms ownership are not unlimited and can be subject to certain types of government regulations. And whereas a city's police power includes the power to regulate firearms and many courts throughout the nation have upheld local regulations related to the ownership or possession of firearms. Yeah, I'd like to see what those look like. And it goes on, whereas firearm injuries have a significant adverse public health and safety impact nationally in the state of California and locally, and whereas each year more than 23,000 United States residents die by firearm suicide, so I guess we're going to blame the gun for that, 14,000 die by firearm homicide, and nearly 500, now this is really important to remember, nearly 500 die from unintentional firearm injuries. They're going to make a big stink later about how they have a big problem with these unintentional firearm injuries in Santa Clara in san jose and they need these re these reduction fees to to offset all these huge costs but keep in mind only 500 die from unintentional firearm injuries each year how many in san jose two three i don't know and we could go ahead and read on this there's a lot of statistics most of it probably junk you know how it is that people cite from studies and don't even understand what they're talking about. Um, it would take all day to go through all of these studies and myth bust them. Maybe for some other day. Now, here's something that's important. Um, this is going to set the stage for their requirement that you have to carry liability insurance if you're going to own a gun in San Jose. It says here, whereas injuries from unintentional shootings which are generally insurable, comprise more than a third of all gun-related injuries nationally. I find that extremely hard to believe. Whereas, in some instances, gun owners have been successfully sued for harm resulting from the use of the owner's firearm by themselves or a third party, of course. Whereas auto insurance have used risk-adjusted premiums to reward good driving, and incentivize use of airbags and other safety features. And this is going to be a problem for them because guess what? The people who are going to be able to take advantage of this are typically well-to-do people. Those who live in poor areas are going to have a harder time getting their rates reduced. Think about it. If you're going to carry liability insurance, who are you going to charge more? The person living in a high crime area? who cannot afford a gun safe and top-notch security, or the rich suburbanite who has a gun safe and alarms on his house. Whereas, similarly, 
insurance-based mechanisms can encourage firearm owners to take safety classes, use gun safes, install trigger locks, or utilize chamber load indicators. All of those things cost money and the poor people can't afford that kind of stuff. So guess who gets to pay the most rates? Poor people. They're in high crime areas, they have very little security, and they can't afford typical gun safety, or at least what they consider to be gun safety. And so the insurance rates are going to skyrocket for these people. Now we'll skip on down. Okay, reduction of gun harm, liability insurance requirement, and gun harm reduction fee. And we're gonna first go through the findings this part is passed and adopted in the exercise of the police power of the city. By the way, those of you people out there who are talking about, oh, the police are your friends. Really? Okay. Not in San Jose, they're not. Guess what the police did when they had the riots going on? They allow people to get assaulted right in front of them, and they did nothing. However, they are going to go and try to take your guns away. And you may be wondering, oh, well, now, wait a minute. There's nothing in here about gun confiscation. Oh, there definitely is. Hang on. And for the protection of the welfare, peace, and comfort of the residents of the city of San Jose. Specifically, it is the intent of this ordinance to reduce gun harm. Okay, we'll see about that. Findings. Firearm injuries have a significant adverse public health and safety impact nationally. And it states here, each year, more than 23,000 United States residents die by firearm suicide, 14,000 die by firearm homicide, and nearly 500 die from unintentional firearm injuries. Well, wait a minute. So they're spelling it out here, 500 and numerically. It's not a typo. So let's go back to their earlier claim injuries from unintentional shootings, which are generally insurable, comprise more than a third of all gun-related injuries nationally. Yet, only 500 die from unintentional firearm injuries nationally. I'm sorry, 500 dying nationally is hardly alarming. And that raises the question, again, how many of these are from San Jose? Probably none or very few, what percentage of the 500 could one city actually gobble up? We move on here. During 2010-2014 in Santa Clara County, 31% of emergency department visits and 16% of hospitalizations from firearm injuries were due to unintentional shootings, but they don't tell you about how many total firearm injuries the hospital experienced. It may be a very small number. Okay, now we're going to skip down. We're going to first define designated nonprofit organization. Now, this seems kind of boring, but let's read it. Designated nonprofit organization means an entity that qualifies as a nonprofit corporation under the Federal Internal Revenue Code, you know, so it could be a 501c3 or 501c4 or whatever, and is designated pursuant to the city manager's authority under Section 1032.235. We'll come back to that in a moment, but here's something very interesting. No city official or employee shall sit on the board of directors of the designated nonprofit organization. Oh boy, you're, you're thinking now, that's great. They're making sure that there are no conflicts of interest here. It doesn't say anything about a city official's wife or husband. They can sit on the board of directors of the designated nonprofit organization, and you're going to see in a minute why that is so important. All right. Liability insurance required. A person who resides in the city and owns or possesses a firearm in the city, and I don't know why they keep capitalizing firearm here, because they're stupid, shall obtain and continuously maintain in full force and effect a homeowner's, renter's, or gun liability insurance policy from an admitted insurer or insurer as defined by the California Insurance Code specifically covering losses or damages resulting from any 
negligent or accidental use of the firearm, including but not limited to death, injury, or property damage. Now, what's important here? Well, first of all, it only covers negligent or accidental use of the firearm. A lot of people are out there thinking that this thing was going to cover uh, cases where if you shoot somebody intentionally, that victim gets to receive the money. No, it doesn't work like that. For purposes of this section, a person shall be deemed to be the owner of a firearm if such firearm is lost or stolen until such loss or theft is reported to the police department or a sheriff. I don't think they can do that. It doesn't matter when you report it, but whatever. Now here's a problem. Let's suppose that I get insurance for my gun, liability insurance, accidental discharge, okay? and I accidentally end up shooting my wife. Uh, who's the benefactor? Let's suppose she dies. Who's the benefactor? Well, she's dead. She can't receive the money. Uh, that would leave me as the benefactor. And you might say, well, now, wait a minute. Now, if you're doing the shooting, uh, then you can't be the benefactor. Well, okay, the next in line would be my kids. That's just as good as far as I'm concerned. And what if you accidentally shoot yourself in the foot? This insurance would cover you. You would get the money. So they're probably not going to be able to cover those, but most of the shootings probably involve the people shooting themselves. So how is this going to reduce all of these horrific 500 unintentional injuries when most of them are not going to be insurable? The insurance company is not going to give you money because you accidentally shot yourself. And if they do, then that raises the question, um, do we really need to insure people to give them money if they stupidly shoot themselves in the foot? And of course, another huge problem with this is who gets the lower rates? The person living in the suburbs who has a safe that can afford all the goodies that go along with being a responsible gun owner or the poor person who can't afford all those things. Well, gee, this is going to make it almost impossible for a poor person to own a gun. That's discrimination. And who would be discriminated against the most? People of color. And believe it or not, that's pretty much the extent of their discussion of the insurance coverage. They don't specify how much insurance you have to get. They don't, under, they don't specify any of the terms, you know. And by the way, uh, once if this thing actually takes place and starts cropping up everywhere, the NRA and the GOA ought to get into the insurance game. They could be great providers of this kind of liability insurance. And boy, wouldn't that piss off the very people who actually instituted this because they hate guns. All right, let's go on to the annual gun harm reduction fee. A person who resides in the city and owns or possesses a firearm in the city shall pay an annual gun harm reduction fee to the designated nonprofit organization each year. Okay, now let's go back. That designated nonprofit organization gets the money. And there's no restriction on city officials' spouses serving on the board of these. Guess what's going to happen in no time? But it gets better. Expenditure of gun harm reduction fee. All monies from the gun harm reduction fee shall be expended by the designated nonprofit organization on providing services to residents of the city that own or possess a firearm in the city they're trying to make this sound like, well, you're paying this fee, but you're getting services in return. Don't buy it. Or to members of their household. Such expenditures may include, but are not necessarily limited to the following. Suicide prevention services. Violence reduction or domestic violence services. Mental health services related to gun violence firearms safety education or training. Okay, so let's think about this. You're a nonprofit and you're going to be designated to receive this money. Now, if people pay the fee like they're supposed to, they won't, but we have to go by the design. 
if they pay the fee like they're supposed to, you're going to get truckloads of cash flowing into your nonprofit. Now, keep in mind, you're not going to be able to expend it. There's simply not enough demand for these services to allow you to expend this money. So guess what happens? Pretty soon, the director of this nonprofit is making six figures. So you're going to end up with nonprofits with heavily bloated salaries for all administrators and officials. And guess what? Some of them are going to be related to the people who are on the city council. You know it. And it says here, no portion of the monies from the gun harm reduction fee shall be used for litigation, political advocacy, or lobbying activities. Now, we've got to read this carefully. No portion of the monies from the gun harm reduction fee shall be used for these. But that doesn't mean that the nonprofit can't now use other monies that it has in its budget to you for these kind of things. And I even know a 501c3 cannot engage in political advocacy or lobbying. They do all the time. And so this is going to be a way to fund an anti-gun initiative by confiscating money from gun owners. But I know what you're thinking. Now, wait a minute. No, the, the city is going to tell these nonprofits how they're going to expend their money, right? Let's read. The city shall not specifically direct how the monies from the gun harm reduction fee are expended. So 501c3s, other nonprofits, they're going to spring up and they're going to rake in millions of dollars. The people that are running these nonprofits are going to start to escalate their salaries. And guess what? A lot of the people on these nonprofits are going to be related to the city council who passed this thing in the first place. Now, there are some exceptions. The provisions of this chapter shall not apply to any of the following. Those persons designated as peace officers pursuant to Chapter 4.5, including sworn peace officers, active reserve peace officers, and retired peace officers. Why in the hell do they get away with this? Can someone explain that to me? Why shouldn't they pay the fee when they are not on active duty? They have their own guns. What allows them to not have to pay this? Now, you may be thinking, now, wait a minute now. Uh, these peace officers, you know they're really safe with guns. Really? Okay, let's take a look at that. San Luis Obispo Police Chief Deanna Cantrell quit suddenly. Well, guess what she did? Cantrell, she was a police chief at the time, left her pistol a Glock with a six-round magazine. Six-round magazine? Really? Okay. In the bathroom of an El Pollo Loco, at about noon on July 10th, 2019. A short time later, Cantrell realized she did not have her weapon and returned to the restaurant bathroom. A short time later, that should have been instantaneous. When you were walking out of the bathroom stall, you should have known, uh-oh, I don't have my gun. It took her a while. And in fact, two people had come in to the restroom and left by the time she realized she was missing her gun. Cantrell realized she did not have her weapon and returned to the restaurant bathroom. The pistol was not there. Cantrell then claimed that she immediately reported her gun stolen, but several officers said her attempt to cover up the theft of her gun risked officer safety and led to the search of the home of a man incorrectly identified as the person suspected of taking the chief's gun. <laughs> so they got the wrong dude. Typically, after a loaded police firearm is stolen, a be on the lookout bolo is put out to area law enforcement, not only to help quickly recover the stolen weapon, but also to protect officer and public safety. However, for the first two hours, Cantrell conducted the investigation into her stolen gun without reporting it. She was hoping she could find the gun before anybody found out. It would be more than eight hours before a bolo was issued. A surveillance video showed a clean-shaven man entering the bathroom after Chief Cantrell left. 
After receiving a tip that the man in the video resembled Shane Orndoff, police descended on Orndoff's home, even though he looked nothing like the suspect. Orndoff had a full beard and mustache. <laughs> so this is really where it gets good. Without a warrant, police searched Orndoff's home, put his daughters, then seven and nine, in foster care, and arrested him for child neglect because of a dirty house and paraphernalia they found in his locked bedroom. There's no chance they're going to make any of that stick. you got to be kidding me. A month later, in June 2019, Cantrell's personal car was stolen from Santa Margarita. <laughs> Officers found the car six hours later in Daly City with a naked woman inside. You can't make this shit up. By the way, um, after the gun incident, she kept her job. That's right. She got to remain as police chief. So she would be allowed to not have to pay this reduction fee because she is trusted with weapons. Now, it also says here, those persons, now remember, we're talking about exceptions, people who don't have to pay the fee. Those persons who have a license to carry a concealed weapon. Now, you may be thinking, oh, well, that's good. Um, they recognize that there's a large number of people who are really good law-abiding citizens who have a concealed weapon permit, and they don't have to pay the fee. You see, they do reward people who are good, responsible gun owners. Yeah, okay. Let's take a look at something here. It says here, permits to carry a concealed weapon can be difficult to obtain in Santa Clara County, as they are in most of the Bay Area. Between 2014 and 2018, 749 Santa Clara County residents applied for a new CCW permit. Hell, in Oklahoma, we probably have that many daily. Only 62 applicants received a permit. Four years, 62 people got a CCW. And you know who these people are? You want to guess? It's Jimmy Bob, right, who owns the uh, gun store downtown, who has owned guns for 50 years and has a spotless record, is a firearms trainer. No, these are going to be politicians. They're the ones that can show that they need a gun because, by golly, they're in a dangerous job. And that is one of the requirements. You have to show that you are in a dangerous environment to receive a CCW. Well, politicians can make that claim. So of these 62, I would be willing to bet that the majority are politicians, lawyers, and friends of the sheriff. The sheriff just gets to decide. By the way, you want to see something even more staggering? Active permits in 2021. This is from Guns to Carry, and it shows you the number of permits that people have in each state. Look at Florida, Pennsylvania, Texas, huge numbers, Georgia. You go down to Oklahoma, where I live, right here, and pretty moderate. There's we do have a lot of CCWs. Remember, we only have about 4 million people living in the state, so our numbers are not going to be huge. But now take a look at California. It has about half the number of Oklahoma, despite its massive population. So if you go back, who's not going to have to pay the fee? Politicians lawyers, and friends of the sheriff. And finally, those persons eligible to proceed without paying court fees and costs. So in other words, if you're indigent, you wouldn't have to pay the fee. At least this policy won't hurt the real poor too much. The insurance deal will kill them. All right, compliance. Each person required to obtain and maintain insurance under section whatever shall demonstrate compliance with the insurance requirement by completing and executing a city-designated attestation form, basically saying, I do have the insurance. Each such person shall state both the name of the insurance company issuing the policy and the number of the insurance policy on the attestation form, Sign the form under penalty of perjury. Yeah, I don't think they can make that stick. I don't think the city can make it stick in court. You can lie to the city. 
Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but just because you write penalty of perjury on a document doesn't mean that the person who's signing it is going to be committing perjury if they lie. Uh, something about in the event the information changes, whatever. Okay, we'll skip that. All right, the authority of the city manager. The city manager is authorized to promulgate all regulations necessary to implement the requirements and fulfill the policies of this part relating to the reduction of gun harm, including, but not, but not limited, to the following subjects. Processes and procedures, designation of the nonprofit organization that will receive the gun harm reduction fee. So it's the city manager that decides that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Do you see the abuses yet? If you don't, you're Ray Charles. So I'll skip down. Regulations promulgated by the city manager shall have the same force and effect of law. Yeah, probably not. Unless a later date is specified in a regulation, a regulation shall become effective upon date of publication. What happens if you don't get the insurance or you don't pay the fee? Well, it says here, any violation of this part shall be punishable by an administrative citation. So you can be cited. Now, here's where things get nasty. And I told you before that this is a gun grab. Listen to this. Impoundment. Now, keep in mind, this is just a city ordinance. This is not a state law. This is not even a county ordinance. This is a city ordinance. But to the extent allowed by law, yeah, the firearm or firearms of a person that is not in compliance with this part may be impounded subject to a due process hearing. Yeah. So in other words, if you don't pay the fee, they can take your guns from you. Those people out there that said, well, they're not coming for your guns. They absolutely are. Why should they be able to? You can cite the person. You can take him to court to make him pay. You may be even able to put a lien on his house for all I know. So why is there a need to impound the gun? The gun has not been used in a crime. The gun has not done anything wrong. And yet they're going to impound them. So here's what's going to happen to San Jose. Okay. They instituted this. Um, the first time they impound a weapon, they're going to get sued. And they're going to lose a shitload of money. So in the end, they're not going to collect that much money from this. Yet they're going to face civil liability here because they're going to impound a weapon sooner or later, and that person is going to go to the NRA, and the NRA is going to sue. And the city is going to lose all that money. Um, keep in mind, the right to bear arms, it basically says, the right to bear arms shall not be infringed. Their argument that they can actually levy a tax against you, essentially, for owning a gun is already unconstitutional. The idea that they can force you to carry liability insurance is unconstitutional. Confiscating guns is blatantly unconstitutional. As soon as they start grabbing weapons that were not involved in a crime, only a civil violation, they are going to get sued for that. So, there it is. Like my video, subscribe to my channel, and let me know what you think.